Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. I can tell you everything about Main Man. Why and what and how and whether it was exciting or not. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. A very long, wonderful adventure. Hello and welcome to episode 44 in our series exploring the history of Main Man, which was the management rights company renowned in the 70s for transforming the business side of rock and roll. The main man philosophy was to provide funding that enabled their artists to fully explore their creative freedom, while pioneering outrageous and often controversial promotions and marketing techniques that became synonymous with the decadence, extravagance and indulgences that are now part of rock folklore. Nobody went to the press and said, oh, we've got David Bowie down here. There was none of that. You could go to a place and you could trust that people wouldn't do anything. Might grass you up to the press. That is gone. Main Man worked with a diverse range of clients that included David Bowie, Amanda Lear, Mick Ronson, John Mellencamp, Mop the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed and Marianne Faithful. It was after I met David I started to write again. Listen to him, we didn't copy him, but I realised that I can't explain it, it was just inspirational. In this episode, as Main Man founder Tony DeFries continues with his highlights of 1971, he explains in great detail the innovative deal he created with RCA, which ensured that David Bowie would control the ownership of his art and not the record company, which was unheard of at the time. In recent months, many of the biggest names in rock have sold the rights to their music for huge amounts of money, highlighting the financial gains possible through rights ownership. So it's an ideal time for Tony to explain the importance of rights and how he formulated his innovative plan. Yes, now it's absolutely true that record companies in the 60s and 70s and even in the 50s didn't understand the long-term value of rights collectively. Individuals, people who were doing business affairs, individual attorneys who studied copyright, did understand it, but generally weren't in a position to influence the record company or more likely its corporate owner, that these things should be acquired. On the other hand, what did happen was the majority of record companies, because they were owned by large corporates, had a corporate policy that said, if we pay for it, we own it. So in that sense, when they were making records, which artists could never afford to pay for themselves, so whether they were recording an orchestra or an opera singer, Caruso, for example, or any other performer, even if it was a large performing entity like a choir, they paid for the recording. And under copyright law, fairly universally, he who pays owns. And that became the standard for record companies. So the idea of going in and saying to a record company, well, I'd like to do a deal with you, but I don't want to get any money from you. That's possible. But again, for most artists, out of reach. Or you could say, I'll make the record. I'll pay the costs. All you have to do is distribution. And how much will you give me for the right to distribute X record? artists or ex-record label or ex-collection of artists. That sort of thinking didn't become really popular until people like David Geffen realised from dealing... Because, you know, he started life as a, the mailroom in William Morris. I mean, David was actually a teenager working at the lowest level of the music performing business, which was being a runner, a gopher, at William Morris, and what he saw there was, if you're an agent and you get the right client or set of clients, especially before anybody else realises that they might be important, you can wield a lot of influence. What he saw was that senior agents at William Morris who had movie stars, like Paul Newman, could actually get an enormous amount of money for their artists' or for their movies, and even 
in the 60s start beginning to make their own movies like Burt Lancaster and Harold Heck did their Lancaster Heck movies or Kirk Douglas owned the rights to Spartacus, which might have been his most successful ever film. So people were somewhat engaged in this idea, but it still hadn't percolated to the levels of individual artists and individual record producers. Whilst we were building the gem business, Lawrence and I, we of course encountered Alan Klein and... We already knew, or at least I already knew, that the smartest thing a record producer could do was create his own label. But for most record producers, and Mickey Most was a perfect example, it wasn't a feasible opportunity because they didn't have the money. When Alan came along and started educating us all about how master recording, leasing, licensing really could work, the American model, it was bit of an eye-opener. It was like, okay, why don't we take Mickey as an independent producer who's now got a whole bunch of hits because this is after House of the Rising Sun. This is into the late 60s probably, so 68, 69 when we start working with Alan. It's part of that whole Beatles breakup era. Alan has come over looking to sign Mickey Most, which is why he reaches out to us. The Beatles... And the Rolling Stones, a pretty ambitious menu. (laughs) But he did actually achieve signing all the Rolling Stones, including Charlie and our best to the party, Charlie, and three of the Beatles. But that's another story. For this story, which is about how David got to be the owner of not just the records he made for RCA, but the records he made for Mercury as well, is where we are today. As you said, we see a lot of artists and songwriters and groups of artists and songwriters looking for a way to either keep or sell. But at this point, it's more likely how to sell the things you've managed to acquire over a career. But if we take it to how people who were creative, who were performing artists or songwriters, singers, bands, how many of them did manage, even now, to keep their own recordings? So we have some examples here. We have Britney Spears. Britney doesn't own any of her recordings. Taylor Swift who owns recordings she made more recently, but all her early recordings, the recordings that made her famous when she was still a teenager, belong to other people. Madonna got signed to an independent record company, but they had a distribution deal that made it impossible for them not to, because she wasn't famous right away. And by the time she got famous, All her records belong to a major record company. Stevie Wonder didn't own any of his recordings, but after we worked with him for a while, he did get to own recordings he made after he turned 21, and those became his most important recordings. He also got to own his publishing. That's another area in which, again, many songwriters didn't realise that they could create their own independent publishing companies and thereby own their own songs. By the time they did realise that, it was very often the case that they'd given up. And that's equally true of Taylor Swift. She gave up a lot of her songwriting copyrights in order to get publishers to support her in using those songs. So that's equally true of all the great names from the past and it's true of many of the names of now. Today, hopefully some new performers will arrive and say, we don't want to go down the road of giving our recordings away because we need the money. We can rather try and find a different method of making and distributing selling both our songs, our music, and our recordings. 
that is most likely to be made possible by the very same set of circumstances that gave rise to record companies in the first place, namely electronic businesses or business in the electronic space are constantly improving on what can be done and that's always now the function of technology make it faster, better, smaller that becomes possible then for brand new performers teenagers like Billie Eilish and her brother to make their own songs on their own equipment and record them on their own equipment and get them out to an enormous audience and become successful artists without the assistance of a major record company. And then if they are well advised, they say, OK, I'll talk to you record companies about distribution, about recording, about touring, but I'll talk to you on the basis that we make a deal where I get to own or ultimately recover these musical works whether they be songs whether they be performances whether they be sound recordings doesn't matter as we move along with that improvement of technology from very crude radio and electronic recording devices to now highly sophisticated internet devices we make a vast possible change in how the industry works and how it benefits creatives. In the 1960s and 70s, I would tell people about the future. Lawrence Myers, who was my partner at GEM, recalls that when he first started working with me, I told him that everyone would have their own computer, and he was completely astonished and thought that was an absurd idea, since at that point... The only computers were enormous pieces of complex equipment in many different parts, which could only be owned by large corporations, and in many cases were not even owned by, but were leased out to them by companies like IBM. And that meant that the idea of somebody having a personal computer was complete fantasy. But actually, it was always apparent to me that you could make that step. You could find that future event. And so for me, it wasn't difficult to think that if I had the right artist, the right writer, the right performer, or the right producer, that I could own or share with that creator the outcome, the result. Even if it meant that I had to sign some kind of distribution deal with the ability to create and the funding to support that particular exercise. And so we had, Lawrence and I had experimented with that, with songwriters, by forming, for example, Tony McCauley, his own production company, which made him a record producer with his own label, which we then licensed to Bell, and a songwriter with his own publishing company. That was a very early and first event in this passage to making records for RCA that we would own and simply license to RCA so that we could, from 1971 when we made the deal, to 1981 when the license expired, we could recover all of those recordings and all of the masters and the artwork and everything else that we made for Bowie and later for Ronson. And all of that material would then belong to us and the artist, in this question, David Bowie. So David ended up being one of the very, very few artists from that era to own his own recordings, or at least a share of his own recordings, and to own his own publishing, or again, a share of his own publishing, ultimately he was able to acquire by simply taking my share, buying my share, the entire 100% ownership of his creative output, an absolute first for an artist from the 1970s. So the idea that a performer could own their own recordings 
was not considered unless the performer had a particular connection to a group of investors or to a record company that had that kind of mindset. Now Frank Sinatra is an interesting example because he was making recordings and movies in the 1940s and the 1950s. Most of his films were made for Warner Brothers. And at that time, when there was a musical which featured Sinatra and others, the soundtrack would come out on a separate record company, on a record company that purchased or licensed the soundtracks from Warner's. Warner's realised that they were, and I say Warner's, I mean the two brothers, the two Warner brothers who were Warner's, they were losing an enormous opportunity to benefit when you had a film in which Frank Sinatra was singing and those songs were being recorded and then the ability to turn that recording into an actual record that could be sold independently of the soundtrack of the movie and to have a separate recording that was the soundtrack of the movie enabled record companies with very little investment to start making lots of money and Warner's realised that they should be doing this themselves, that they should be releasing, at a minimum, their own soundtracks of their own musical films. Once they realised that, they also realised that because Sinatra was probably the most popular live performer and musical performer and singer on the planet, that they should sign him to some kind of recording contract. They needed to start with a record company. So they formed Reprise Records. They also then needed to persuade Frank to sign up to Reprise Records. And he had two conditions. One, he said, he'll happily make Reprise Records his record company, but he needs to have a stake. And they agreed on a 20% stake going to Frank for simply agreeing to sing. It's quite a nice stake for agreeing to sing, if you think about it. (laughs) Remember, this reprise records began as a little label just for dedicated soundtrack recordings, but not that much longer. We're talking maybe 30 to 40 years later. It was a major record label. It was a major music business player. And of course, somewhere in that era, it got folded into the Time Warner And again, doing full circle, the first major online business, America Online, they all got together and created a multi-billion dollar business. And they had a slight snack. What do we do about Frank? He's now got a huge stake. So they bought him out. The most money that Frank Sinatra made in his entire career was from holding a 20% interest in reprise. The other thing that Frank asked for. And he didn't really ask for it, he demanded it. He said, if you're going to have a record company, it's going to have my recordings. I need you to employ this person to run the record company. This person was called Mo Austin. And he didn't know anything about record companies. A very nice man. We had lots of nice conversations, Mo and I. What he did know an awful lot about was finance. And especially the finance of large-scale enterprises dealing with, let's say, honestly, the mob. And the mob that he was bookkeeper for was the same mob that Frank had a lot of connections with and a lot of friends in. And, of course, the Rat Pack was Peter Lawford and Sammy Davis Jr. And they were all people who frequented Vegas. They sang and performed in the casinos. Don't forget Dean Martin was also part of that group and a very, very successful crooner, a massively successful movie star, a very good-looking guy as well. All of these people were well-connected to those people who started and still owned most of the Vegas casinos. And we know that all the money for the Vegas set up the Vegas casinos for turning Vegas into Vegas came from 
a variety of criminal enterprises, sometimes disguised with legitimate enterprises, or sometimes actually the owners of legitimate enterprises, and they set up Vegas to be a place where you could come and gamble, and you could also hear and see live music. And at the same time, it was a marvellous opportunity for laundering money. <laughs> so, all of that is in that one tale. In the 1960s, you had this enormous uh, explosion of talent. And a large part of it was driven by a post-war population that had grown up in an era of radio, the beginnings of television, a technology that allowed them to express themselves in ways that they hadn't been able to previously. And of course, cafes and clubs became places where individual performers like Tommy Steele or Cliff Richard and so on could perform and get broadcast on the radio while they were performing. Live broadcasts were now possible. You could also perform in clubs like the Marquee and other London clubs. Dana recounts that when she was beginning her recording and performing and songwriting career, she used to go and hang out at the Gioconda Cafe in Berwick Street in Soho. Because it was close to the Tim Pan Alley of the UK, the music publishers all had buildings in that area. And so Dana and Reg, who we know now as Elton John, and Donovan, who's still Donovan, and David Robert Jones, who we turned into David Bowie, and occasionally people from the Beatles and people from the Rolling Stones and other folk who hadn't yet found what they were looking for, knew that if they were in these places and a music publisher needed someone to come and sing or play on a demo of a song that they could hopefully get covered by an existing major artist, there was a pool of these young guys and girls waiting to be called to come and do exactly that. Dana and David and Donovan and Reg and Bernie Taupin, who became his songwriting partner, all made these kind of recordings for example, for Dick James Music. Dick James Music were one of the leading publishers at the time. Um, Northern Songs was another one. And then, of course, you had the Essex Music, which was part of the old TRO, the Richmond Organization in America, which was an older publishing house and had Essex as a subsidiary in the UK. So all these people were hanging out together and let's not forget, this included people who later formed bands like The Who, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, etc. They were all looking for that opportunity to catch up with somebody who might give them exposure to a record deal. And a lot of them got record deals just because they were in that small group. They all ended up working together. We ended up working, of course, with lots of them. Led Zeppelin, they never owned their recordings. Even though they became a very successful, probably the most successful super band, they never got to own their recordings. Likewise, both Graham Nash and Stephen Stills, who were in that same space and went on to become Cosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Neil Young, didn't own their recordings. And there's a long, long list of these people. And of course, it includes the Beatles. Even when they broke up, the solo Beatles still didn't own their own recordings. Frequently, the desire to get a band together, whether it was Earth, Wind & Fire, or whether it was Pink Floyd, or The Who, the need, the desire to get the band together, it sort of overrode the idea that you might stop take a breath, take a step back, think about what do you want this band to do and whose records do you want to own? Do you want to make this deal with the devil, which is the record company, who's going to tell you we need this many records, we need them to be this long, this short, we need them to be this way, 
and we're going to pay you a meagre royalty and possibly a big advance, but we will own the records. For most musicians, most bands, most people who'd essentially made a living from doing sessions, it was so desperately important to have their own band or their own record deal. And David went through this. David made multiple record deals and multiple records. I think he made seven different record deals with seven different labels and at least four albums, two of which we managed to recover, in his 10-year effort to become David Bowie. And what the outcome of that was that with the exception of the Mercury Records, all the other recordings remained in the hands of people that had really no interest in promoting them, only began to promote them after he became famous. And that's the sad story of being a recording artist. Now, you'd think it should have changed today. Today, you should have a much more educated... But unfortunately, it doesn't. It doesn't change rapidly. It changes slowly. And now, you can look at artists who were very successful in the last 20 years. So take someone like Whitney Houston, didn't own her own recordings. Even after they broke up, the Beatles were still tied to their recordings being owned by EMI. Eventually, we helped them to escape from that, but the Beatles recordings that they made as the Beatles still belong to the record company and not to them. What changed with my approach to David was I knew, because I'd worked in a lot of copyright spaces outside of the music era, but in other copyright arenas. For example, when I was still working as a legal practitioner, I took part in a patent dispute and ultimately a patent resolution for a product that has nothing to do with music and yet may have everything to do with music. It's quite peculiar that because the product was invented by one group of people and exploited by another group which is very often the case. It was a small box in which you could put a bunch of hair curlers and it was called Carmen Curler. And the important thing about it was that it was the first time that anyone had separated the hot curler from the heating element. So part of the problem with curling your hair before Carmen came along, and similar things obviously followed it, was you either had to roll your hair up in a ribbon and then sleep in it overnight and hope that it curled from the heat of your head whilst you were sleeping, one way, or you had to have a curling iron which would almost always end up searing your scalp in some places (laughs) and burning your hair so that it fell out. It was not an easy thing to use. It was very difficult to use on your own. It was easier if somebody else used it on your hair. But the risks of messing up your hair and your scalp were very large. What the Carmen Curler did was, it said, OK, we're going to make a box with a bunch of standing up posts. The box will be plugged into an electrical outlet and will heat up. What will heat up is actually the posts. The Carmen Curler was a thin layer of metals which was filled with oil. So it got hot. On the outside, it was a plastic construction of a curler. It came in multiple sizes, so you could have small curls or large curls, depending on your hair and which curler you chose. The fact that it didn't ever allow your head or your hair to come in touch with a hot surface because the surface was always covered by the plastic rollers which got warm but not hot meant that you could make yourself look like a movie star at home. It was wildly successful. So it's still around today actually. <laughs> Although it's improved. And of course a lot of people, especially girls who sang or danced or performed in the music industry 
found that this was an invaluable traveling companion to go and do live performances or television or whatever it might be because they could literally get a full curl hairdo on the fly, on the spot. And it also was one of my early forays into patenting and copywriting these kind of devices. So I had a different point of view when it came to copyright than most attorneys and certainly a different point of view than most music business attorneys. So that meant we could take a different slope on the Bowie RCA contract. Tony DeFries explaining the unlikely link between a set of hair curlers and David Bowie, which ultimately led to the historic pioneering rights deal that DeFries engineered for David 50 years ago. In the next episode in the Main Man series, Tony describes why he chose to sign with RCA specifically instead of one of the other major players in the record industry at the time. There are some great pieces of memorabilia from this period in rock history that are part of an ever-growing archive of main man documents, including contracts that you heard Tony talking about, articles, telexes, letters and production notes, a lot of them never seen before, that we're adding to the main man label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the main man series. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening.